This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. And straight ahead on the program, bank earnings. Wall Street's top firms start reporting this week. I'm Tom Busby in New York, and I'll have that story. I'm Stephen Carroll in London, where we're watching out closely for signs of whether or not the UK is in recession. I'm Doug Krisner, looking at Taiwan's presidential election, one that will help shape the course of U.S.-China relations for years. I'm Kaylee Lines in Washington, where we're looking at polling as election year 2024 gets underway. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, the business news you need to wrap up your week. Available on Apple, Spotify, the Bloomberg Business app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby, and we begin today's program with the kickoff of the latest earnings season. Four of Wall Street's biggest banks report their latest quarterly results this week, wrapping up a year of some mid-sized bank failures, rising interest rates, and a dearth of deal-making, at least for most of the year. But we also saw the major averages soar higher, the Dow reaching an all-time high in late December, and there was no real recession. For a preview, we welcome Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst Allison Williams and Bloomberg Global Finance Correspondent Shanali Basik. Now, all the action starts on Friday. We hear from J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. And we're going to start today with Allison. Allison, what are you expecting to see from those major lenders? The two key things we're going to be looking at are net interest income and expenses. So in the fourth quarter, we're going to be looking for further evidence that the pressure on deposit pricing um, is easing a bit, and those costs are easing a bit. And we think that the outlook for next year is going to factor in a further moderation of that pressure, just given the fact that the markets are pricing in an inflection point uh, for Federal Reserve hikes. As those hikes turn to easing, uh, the pressure for banks to raise those prices on deposits, keep in mind that that's their um, cost of goods sold, um, that pressure eases. And so that will be a positive for the biggest banks. We think that um, JP Morgan's net interest income is going to be resilient. We think there could be some some upside to those numbers. Um, But the second thing that we're looking at is the cost guidance. And again, um, JP Morgan will be a focus in particular um, because uh, we get a lot of macro clues for all the banks during the quarter, but expense guidance always includes an element of investment spending. Uh, JP Morgan has won in the long term by making those investments. But if we look at uh, the consensus forecasts, those investments are going to cause the bank to have negative operating leverage in 2024. Uh, we'll see what we hear from management in terms of you know, what the outlook is, because while there is investment spending and we do think that banks need to invest for the future, there's also pressure on costs coming from inflation. There's also going to be pressure from uh, what we call the cost to compete. And we think that compensation costs could be uh, a little bit sticky across the global banks. Shanali? Yeah, th- there's definitely expenses. But to Allison's point, one big question is, if interest rates start to cool, at what point does that not only flow into the notion of uh, deposit pricing, but also loan demand? Does loan demand start to pick up if interest rates start to cool? Now, what's interesting, too, is in recent months, you've started to, to see different credit markets open up meaningfully, including leverage finance. So we're not just talking about lending for the consumer. We're even talking about risky parts of debt markets for big corporations, buyouts, things that could start to fuel activity again. So you will see a a real need to look at the outlook from these bankers because they have come in to the prior quarters with so much caution, and you really are seeing that caution starting to wane. Jamie Dimon, who has been warning that rates could move higher than expected for many, many months, if he starts to change his tone there, it would be a massive bellwether for the rest of the industry. Whereas you already had James Gorman, who just stepped down as the CEO of Morgan Stanley, he had uh, definitely been very sanguine in terms of the outlook for interest rates this year. And remember, he was still leading Morgan Stanley through the end of the last quarter. Well, Shanali, you mentioned uh, James Gorman. You had a one-on-one interview with him last week about his 14-year tenure as CEO of Morgan Stanley. Now he is executive chairman. He also spoke about some proposed banking rules that would require the biggest lenders to increase to 20% their capital cushion. Now, it's proposed, but let's hear a bite from that interview right now. It was a proposal that I would say 
was extremely aggressive and set a marker. Um, it will not go through in that form. If it did, uh, I think it would have very, very negative consequences for corporate lending across this country, which is not what you want. It's not going to help the economy grow. Well, you've also spoken about the Treasury market potential impacts from these regulations. Sure. We've already seen stresses of late in the Treasury market. Do you have fears that those stresses will be exacerbated? I can't tell until I see the actual rules, but all I know is what was put out is highly, highly, highly unlikely to be what is ultimately regulated. Now, is he right? And and what are those proposals? And what would have to change? You saw James Gorman and many of his peers take to Washington, D.C. and address lawmakers about this fact. And what they were trying to do was get the lawmakers to put pressure on uh, regulatory officials to start to rethink the strictness of these capital rules. They were warning that it would really restrict lending across different parts of the economy. It would restrict trading activity in certain key markets like commodities. It would increase the cost of hedging uh, for many big players in commodity markets and farming markets, rural America would be impacted, they warned. Now, what's interesting here is we know from a Wall Street perspective that those increase in capital rules would be very expensive for the banks. And for him to say they're likely to be less really starts to draw a question uh, of how much these banks can start to recalibrate their expectations on how costly it would be, maybe less costly than investors initially expected if James Gorman is right. Allison, what's your thoughts on that? So if you look at some of these regulations, um, you know, two things. First of all, uh, as you said, it does require uh, relatively large increases in capital to be held across the largest banks. And actually, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are some of the hardest hit because two of the key um, uh, you know, two of the key risk factors that the rule aims to address are market risk and operational risk. But uh, if you analyze the rules, um, and again, we've heard, um, you know, perhaps Jamie Dimon has been one of the most vocal about some of the double counting of operational risk uh, inherent in this proposal. Uh, if we look across some of the other regulations, such as the stress capital buffer, which already penalizes banks uh, for this type of risk. And, and, and so there is sort of an element of double counting. Also, if we look at the rules versus some of the other jurisdictions, it does seem that there is a fair amount of gold plating, uh, meaning that the rules uh, do look a little bit tougher in the way that they've been implemented in the U.S. Uh, versus jurisdictions such as the U.K. and uh, Europe. Well, until we get to that, I want to just dial back on what we can look forward to this week. And which of those big banks, Shanali, I'm going to ask you, we have J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. Which ones do you think are going to have the results that Wall Street is looking for? Now, you have to remember that a lot of these banks really either sold off or had very weak performance last year, except for J.P. Morgan, which rose more than the pack and actually hit a new record high early this year in its stock price. But you think about Goldman, for example, and Goldman's analyst that covers the banking sector has recently said that J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo could see more higher, um, could see even higher net interest income. Like we've been talking about, it's two of their big picks. We know uh, Wells Fargo's Mike Mayo has also also pointed out that Citigroup has a lot of growth potential. There's a lot of divergence here, but th what we've seen in the trends is that the bigger get bigger. What's going to get interesting after the biggest banks report is the regional banks. And the week after also is um, the, the big investment banks. You were talking about the weak deal volumes, right? The interesting thing here is in the third, uh, the fourth quarter of last year, you saw deal volumes jump by $160 billion just from the third to the fourth quarter. After being stagnant all year, pretty much. It's been the worst year in a decade for deals. And so what happens is the bankers get paid when those deals close, not upon announcement, typically. So those deals that are announced lead to fees to tomorrow. And so those banks, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and JP Morgan, which can start to also see those um, deal fees start to impact their bottom line, they could become very interesting this year if their predictions come true and they finally see deals pick up like they've been expecting for so long. Allison, the final word? I would say that on, on Friday, we'll, we'll see J.P. Morgan and Bank of America continuing to execute, um, despite some challenges in the environment. Uh, Wells Fargo and Citigroup 
are um, more longer term stories where they're restructuring. And I think investors are going to want to hear from, you know, Citigroup sort of where they are uh, in the path of that restructuring. Similar to Wells Fargo, what is going to be the outlook for costs? Are we getting um, closer or any kind of news related to some of their regulatory challenges? We'll also be looking for any uh, big legal costs because we do tend to get those kitchen sinks uh, for some of the banks in the quarter. Um, But again, it is all about the expectations and and what is is in the stock. J.P. Morgan is likely to generate the highest return we expect, um, but that's no secret. Well, a lot to look forward to. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst Allison Williams and Bloomberg Global Finance Correspondent Shanali Basik. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we take you to London and a look ahead to a busy week on the economic calendar. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. The UK's economic trajectory back in focus in the coming days as a batch of data will help tell us whether Britain could avoid a recession. A recent survey of company executives highlighted their pessimism about the outlook despite encouraging signs from some quarters. Now for more, let's go to London and bring in Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor Stephen Carroll. Tom, it's 2024 and we're still asking questions about whether or not the UK will fall into recession, when it might happen and how bad it could be. We'll get an update on the monthly GDP numbers in the coming days. It'll give us some more clues along with other indicators we're watching too. There have been some positive signals. The latest composite PMI survey showing an uptick in activity to a reading of 52.1 in December. Thinking more long term, a recent forecast from the Centre for Economics and Business Research predicted the UK's growth trajectory over the next decade or so will help it retain its position as the world's sixth largest economy. There's gloom in other quarters, though. The Institute of Directors Economic Confidence Survey fell in December to close to its lowest point in the year. So are we hurtling towards a recession or is growth getting back on track? To discuss, we've got our UK economy reporter Tom Rees and for a look at how the consumer is faring, our UK retail reporter Katie Linsell. Tom, I'd like to start with you. We're due to receive some economic data in the coming days, including figures on UK manufacturing and the monthly GDP figures I mentioned. What might they tell us? So while it's quite hard to read signals from one month's data, um, November's GDP figures could be a bit more significant than they usually are, just because it may show that the UK was on track for a technical recession um, in the second half of uh, last year. We had some revised data from just before Christmas that showed GDP contracted 0.1% in the third quarter. and then that was followed by a 0.3% fall in GDP in October. So that, 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 that leaves some catching up to do in November, December, if we're going to avoid a technical recession, i.e. two straight quarters of uh, fallen output. I, I, I think the main thing to take away from the second half of last year, it was a real diverging picture um, between the sectors. You know, we have services that have been relatively resilient, despite, you know, the extreme pressure on consumers from the cost of living crisis and you know higher mortgage payments and everything but the manufacturing sector is is struggling um we've seen that in the survey data it's seen lower demand from overseas and domestically factories are feeling you know the pain from higher interest rates and they're starting to cut employment um so it's it's, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a complicated picture but um it's all it, it all looks quite stagnant from uh f- from from the second half of the year yeah, and as you say, it's it's that question of, of where we are in that last quarter GDPs and we get the monthly figures just giving us a piece of that picture and, and whether or not that we will head for those two quarters of negative growth. Katie, I wanted to bring you in here because one of the figures we're going to be getting is one of the retail sales measures from the British Retail Consortium. This is going to cover a period which is very important for retailers towards the end of the year, that pre-Christmas shopping period. What are we? What are you expecting? Absolutely, you're right. I mean, that Christmas period is so important, so crucial for many retailers. If we look at the figures that we saw in November from the British Retail Consortium, they were actually quite weak. They did show growth, but much weaker growth uh, compared to a year earlier. So what we have to be hoping is that many consumers pushed their Christmas spend into December rather than relying on that earlier November 
shopping period. Um, but I think it's, it's really yet to be seen. From what we hear so far, online has had a better performance, uh, the Christmas just gone, compared to 2022. Uh, many shoppers were put off uh, by courier delays and postal strikes in that earlier Christmas season, uh, which meant they visited more stores to be sure they could get hold of items. I think online will have had a much better time um, in Christmas 23, but really it's still it's still to be seen how, how this goes. And from what we've seen from retailers it's a mixed bag you know some performing better than the christmas before others having a bit of a difficult time so it, it's still to be seen how it will go yeah katie i'm always very interested to see when we get the split from grocers on this because i mean grocery is a very competitive market in the uk and and seeing the discounters coming out and talking about having their best christmas as ever is that something that we've heard from many retailers and in, in what we've heard so far from them about their pre-christmas period yeah absolutely Absolutely. So as you say, we've had Aldi and Little come out very quickly in the new year saying they had record Christmas sales. Um, Kantar, which actually tracks sales figures across supermarkets, said that there was a record £13.7 billion spent in the run up to Christmas. I think it's fair to say that most supermarkets did well. Um, we're going to be getting both Sainsbury and Tesco uh, reporting uh, next week. And I think um, both of those have probably done pretty well over that Christmas season. Um, I mean, food inflation has come down a bit. It's still at nearly 7%. Um, so I think that that higher, the higher prices do have a role to play in these big, chunky sales figures we're seeing. Um, but at the same time, um, hopefully shoppers are feeling more encouraged to spend on food than they did, say, a year ago. Um, so, yes, yeah, supermarkets have been a very, very comfortable uh, part of retail this, these past few weeks. Tom, when we think to, to looking back at the data we have already and thinking about where the trajectory we're going in yet, it feels like we've been hearing about warnings of a recession in the UK for, I mean, at least a year now at this stage. Like, let's be honest. Are we overdue a recession here? Um, it has felt like we've been on the brink of recession basically since that post-lockdown surge in GDP wharf and the cost of living crisis began. But I mean, the, this economy has shown incredible ability to muddle through, to be stagnant but resilient against some pretty massive headwinds in double-digit inflation and the surge in interest rates. And uh, like you said, that date we, ju- we got just before Christmas, it did show that we may have suffered a technical recession but I mean the difference between a technical recession and very slight growth at the moment is pretty tiny but it also showed and I think this is crucial for the outlook um, it showed that inflation came down a lot more than the Bank of England was expecting down to below 4% and I think for the outlook that that is the key really because that not only affects you know uh, you know, real wages for consumers, but also uh, what what we might see on uh, interest rates. Yeah, and of course, the the fact that we had the the, the run of, of fourteen strike hikes in the Bank of England, still feeling, of course, the effects of that feeding into the market, partly due to the way that the mortgage market structured here. Not everyone has actually had the interest rate increase, although we're we're getting closer to that position now. What should we be thinking about when it comes to where the Bank of England goes from here? Of course, speculation abound about in, central banks around the world and and when they're going to cut interest rates. What sort of scenario is the Bank of England facing when we look into 2024? I mean, it's interesting because uh, after that inflation print um, just before Christmas that, that showed inflation coming down much faster than we were expecting, um, obviously markets took that as the green light for early interest rate cuts. And they're, currently they're pricing in the first cut um, from May and then a further four or five after that uh, over the uh, by the end of the year. Um, but the Bank of England, you know, it had its latest policy meeting just after that those inflation figures. And it was it was still holding this high for longer message. It's still trying to tell markets that, you know, don't expect us to pivot to cuts anytime soon, which was quite in quite sharp contrast with what we're hearing from the Fed um, around that time as well. So although, you know, the Bank of England is trying to, you know, ward off markets and 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 tell them to you know that they're going to hold pat for quite quite some time that markets are running away with it now and that they they are expecting cuts to to come sometime in the first half of this year
Yeah, and just looking at the market pricing for that as well, market's currently pricing in a first rate cut from the Bank of England uh, in around May of this year and around a hundred and uh, just over 135 basis points of cuts by the end of 2024 as well. So certainly a very interesting year uh, for the Bank of England. OK, Katie Linsell, our UK retail reporter and our UK economy reporter, Tom Rees, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your analysis on that subject. We will, of course, have coverage of those GDP and other economic indicators on the programme in the coming days. I'm still Stephen Carroll in London. You can catch us every weekday morning here for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London and 1am on Wall Street. Tom? Our thanks to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor Stephen Carroll. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we head to Asia and preview a key presidential election in Taiwan. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Tom Busby in New York with your global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. Taiwan's presidential election is set for January 13th, and the results will help shape the course of U.S.-China relations for years to come. Bloomberg Daybreak Asia anchor Doug Krisner looks ahead. Tom, the election is a competitive three-way race, and the ruling Democratic Progressive Party is seeking to maintain Taiwan's de facto political independence. Now, to help us set up the contest, we have Bloomberg's Samson Ellis. He is our Taipei bureau chief. Samson, thank you for being with us. As I mentioned, it's a three-way race. Can you quickly kind of help sketch out who the candidates are, what their prospective parties stand for, particularly in relation to the government in Beijing. Well, first of all, you have the v- current vice president, Lai Qingde. So he is the candidate for the, as you said, the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP. So this is a party that uh, holds as one of its foundational uh, tenets that uh, Taiwan is a sovereign, independent nation. Uh, the only problem is is that it, it's not widely recognized by the rest of the world. So, so they are pushing for you know, a, a permanent separate status for Taiwan, uh, separate from uh, China, obviously. So, so right now he's the current vice president and he is looking to uh, succeed his current boss, President Tsai Ing-wen. Then, uh, running against him, you have the largest opposition party in Taiwan, the Kuomintang or the KMT. Um, And this is a party that uh, holds that Taiwan is actually a part of a uh, China, a slightly more vaguely defined China, not necessarily the People's Republic of China, but a some kind of China, and that Taiwan's uh, eventual future lies uh, with China and in some form of unification with the, the mainland. Uh, and their candidate is uh, former policeman, Taiwan's former top policeman, uh, Hou Youyi, uh, who is running against Lai. And then this year, which makes this election uh, slightly unique, as you have a third a uh, competitive candidate and this is uh, a Ke Wenzhe from the new relatively young uh, Taiwan's People's Party. So Ke is something of a, a left field candidate, a very non-traditional politician. So he was a, a surgeon in one of Taiwan's top hospitals uh, for a long time uh, until one day he decided that he couldn't stand the state of politics in Taiwan and ran for mayor of Taipei as an independent and surprisingly won. Mm. Uh, around 10 years ago, uh, he was then a mayor for eight years. Uh, and then after he stepped down, Um, He set up his own party, and since then he's been teasing that he could run for president, and this year he actually did it. Um, And so he has proved uh, to be quite popular with uh, voters who are tired of the duopoly of Taiwan politics, the traditional, either it's the DPP or the KMT, and now uh, Kerr has given disaffected voters something of an option. Recently, we had uh, President Xi with his New Year address, and one of the things he reiterated was that China will be surely unified, maybe a reference to the aim here of eventually bringing Taiwan back under the control of the mainland, if forced by necessary. And I'm based on what you just said, I'm imagining that the KMT candidate would be based Beijing's preferred choice. Is is that fair? Yes, absolutely. So they do share this one overarching goal that, uh, you know, eventually Taiwan should be formally unified uh, as part of China. What they do disagree on is what that China should be. So obviously, from Xi Jinping's perspective, 
It's the People's Republic of China, the China that we all know uh, now. But uh, for the KMT in Taiwan, a really important part of their history was their fight in the Chinese Civil War against the Communist Party. Uh, and so theoretically, they uh, many people in the party still view the Chinese Communist Party as an enemy. And if, if you meet them, you know, privately, they'll quite happily tell you that, uh, you know, the, the, the communists in Beijing are still their, their mortal em- enemy. Um, but at least they do have one thing in common is that they feel Taiwan would be better off eventually being part of China. I think the U.S. probably is going to be watching this race very closely. I think that's fair to say. At the end of uh, last year, near the end, I think it was in November, that uh, Presidents Biden and Xi were at the APEC summit in San Francisco. And it was then that Xi told Biden that the issue of Taiwan was the most important and dangerous issue for the U.S. and China and, and their relationship. How do you think, and I'm not asking you to speculate, but based on what you know of U.S. Taiwan relations, how might the U.S. kind of be watching this contest? And not that it would put its finger on the scale in any way, but is there something that the U.S. would kind of communicate to Beijing to make sure that there is no interference or, or uh, let's say, a reduction in, in the degree of influence Beijing may like to have over these elections? Well, there's no doubt that the U.S. is watching this election very, very closely. Uh, Taiwan has become this pivotal uh, point in, you know, the geopolitical standoff between uh, the United States and China. And as Xi Jinping said there, as you mentioned, you know, it is one of the most important issues in, in relations between uh, Washington and Beijing. And so one of the things the U.S. has repeatedly reiterated is that, number one, they have no preferred winner of the Taiwanese election. They've been very clear uh, that, you know, they respect the choice of uh, Taiwanese voters. Um, And they have also urged other parties, I think we can infer they're largely talking to Beijing here, uh, that other parties should stay out of the race. They should not meddle in this election. Um, Beijing, for its part, it has made it absolutely clear that they would prefer the KMT candidate uh, to win this election. To be honest, there's a bit of a you know, who who would the US prefer to win? Um, you hear different voices out of the United States on this. On the one hand, if the DPP stays in power, uh, the US can be fairly sure they have a reliable, steady partner who is on board with uh, the United States and their uh, more broader regional goals when it comes to standing up against China. And also they have a more willing recipient for uh, US arms sales. Um, But on the other hand, if the KMT were to win, some in the US do point out that this could take a little bit of the temperature out of the the cross-strait relations uh, in this part of the world and therefore make U.S.-China uh, relations a little bit easier. Yeah, I understand the notion of supporting democracies from the U.S. side, but I'm understanding also that there is a little bit of a national security concern if you consider the fact that Taiwan is basically the leader in semiconductor production. I'm thinking in particular of Taiwan Semi. If that were not the case, would the U.S. stance be slightly different, do you think? I think it's a question of degrees. I think there's no doubt that uh, the United States, as you said, supports uh, a fellow democracy. And it's a very bad look for the United States if they're seen throwing uh, a democracy to the wolves in Asia, so to speak. And, And also, you know, there is the Taiwan Relations Act in the United States. You know, the U.S. has committed itself to providing for Taiwan's own self-defense. Uh, and so there is a legal basis uh, for Ta- uh, for the U.S. continuing to support Taiwan. So I don't think that would uh, be something the U.S. could easily abandon. Plus, you know, you, within the United States, I mean, you look at um, Congress, there's, there's an enormous amount of support uh, on both sides of the aisle for Taiwan there. So even if the executive were to decide that uh, supporting Taiwan is no longer in uh, you know America's best interests, I think they'd find a lot of pushback uh, uh, you know, from Congress on, on anything that would uh, disadvantage Taiwan. It was January 1st, uh, 1979, I believe, that Washington officially cut diplomatic ties with Taipei in favor of recognizing Beijing. How well do you think the U.S. has been doing it, it kind of balancing the situation. It's underappreciated exactly how successful the Taiwan's Relations Act and uh, strategic ambiguity has worked over the past 40 plus years, 45 years now. Um, 
at maintaining the peace in this part of the world. Samson, so good of you to stop by and help us set up the Taiwan presidential election that will happen on January 13th. Samson Ellis is Bloomberg's Taipei bureau chief. I'm Doug Krisner, and you can join Brian Curtis and myself weekdays here for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia beginning at 7 a.m. in Hong Kong, 6 p.m. on Wall Street. Tom? Our thanks to Bloomberg Daybreak Asia anchor Doug Krisner. And coming up here on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we look ahead to the presidential election right here in the U.S. with Gallup Editor-in-Chief Mohammed Yunus. Next, I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. New polling from Gallup shows President Joe Biden finishing 2023 with a job approval rating of just 39 percent. That's the lowest of recent presidents at the same point in their presidency. Gallup editor-in-chief Mohammed Yunus tells Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines in our Bloomberg 99.1 newsroom in Washington about trends to follow heading into the 2024 presidential election. I'm not sure that President Biden is feeling particularly happy as he comes into this new year, knowing he ended last year, 2023, according to Gallup's figures, with an approval rating of just 39 percent. Can you give us some context around that number? It's quite low. The real context is compared to every other president in modern history who has sought re-election, he's far behind where they were. Um, Traditionally speaking, what we've seen in our numbers is that a president going into a re-election campaign at that 50 point mark is a really critical number to be at. And obviously, President Biden is far beyond be behind that, but he's also significantly behind where Barack Obama was and where Donald Trump was, which is pretty important to note, I think. Um, during the Trump campaign, there was so much focus on how low and steady the number stayed. And President Biden right now is behind where President Trump was. Well, and you talk about the numbers staying low and being pretty steady. Isn't that the case with Biden? I mean, he's been in and around that kind of 40% figure or below for some time now, and it doesn't seem like that has that needle has moved to any real degree at all. It hasn't. He started off like most presidents do in a honeymoon phase. He has that 57% approval, which is pretty high uh, for in our era. Mm. Another thing, Kaylee, to always keep in mind with these numbers specifically is we are in tr- what is truly is a hyper-partisan era. So since President Obama, the difference between people's um, views on the president and how closely it's tied to their party ID is stronger than ever. So presidents have had flatter um, sort of frequencies on their approval ratings. Mm -hmm. But I think what's concerning about President Biden's situation is that even compared to Obama and Trump, who also face that reality, he's significantly behind right now. Okay, well, let's talk about the options. I mentioned that we're seeing in pretty consistently in polls that the majority of voters would prefer it not to be a Biden-Trump rematch like 2020 all over again. And yet that's likely what they're going to get unless there is a viable alternative. What are you seeing around support for a third party candidate, who, whoever that is? Well, I can tell you who we see in terms of favorables of mm-hmm. all the folks that are out there right now. Um, President Biden and Trump are basically tied at 41 percent of a favorable rating. And this is do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of the following person? DeSantis, Haley in specific, sorry, are at their 30. So really low 30 percent favorable rating. Mm-hmm. It's important to note that This tends to happen with new names. People don't know who they are. Um, Kennedy, on the other hand, is already breaking the 50-point mark, but that's probably because of that name recognition Mm -hmm. factor that he has in his favor. So looking at the favorable ratings, which is really a really good proxy, I think, at this point of the contest to see who's gaining traction with the public, really none of them are. Nobody's really shot through the roof um, and impressed or wowed, of course, January 15th is just down the street. Um, A lot can change, uh, particularly when those first results start coming out from the caucuses. But right now, nobody's dominating. All right. We only have about a minute left, Mohammed. but we've discussed, we've covered a lot of ground here in what 2024 may bring, how how people are feeling. What is one other trend or something that you'll be focusing on in 2024? I think for us, it'll be the election. It'll Mm -hmm. be what people are really tuning into for Um, making that decision to cast their vote. One thing we really know right now is most Americans are still totally checked out. They're not (laughs) focused on political news, unlike you and I, night and day. I know it hurts my feelings too. But um, as it gets closer to November, that number is going to rise and we're going to start asking people, what do you bring into mind when you cast that vote? 
It's a good point. I feel like we've been living and breathing this for a year now, but really it's still early days. Muhammad Yunus joining us, Gallup's editor-in-chief. Thank you so much, as always, for being here. It's going to be a doozy of the year, guys. Thank you, Kaylee. That was Bloomberg Sound on co-host Kaylee Lines reporting from our Bloomberg 991 newsroom in Washington. And you can hear Sound on weekdays, 1 to 3 p.m. on Bloomberg Radio. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend. Join us again Monday morning, 5 a.m. Wall Street time for the latest on markets overseas and the news you need to start your day. I'm Tom Busby. Stay with us. Top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.